What is going on, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back to review the new film Sharper, which is coming to Apple TV Plus on the 17th. And not to worry, I will avoid all spoilers. But at the very end of the video, I'll give you a warning. But I've got one or two comments that you can might regard as spoiler light, just to make my point. But the reason I'm going to be so careful about spoilers is because this is a movie about con artists. And anytime you're dealing with a story where you've got a lot of cons within cons and scams within scams and double crosses and grifters, etc., the delight, the joy, like the music of the story is all about watching the incredibly intricate plot slowly unfold. And I would say that for about 90% of this movie, it is airtight and fucking riveting and wildly entertaining and just slick and sexy. And toward the end, I would just say that it kind of takes its foot off the gas just a little bit. It goes from being really good to just pretty good, but hell, I'll take that any day over 99% of the movies out there. And I just feel like, yeah, A24 and Apple, this is a dream collaboration because A24, they're the tastemakers. They have this incredible brand and they have an eye for great material and great, great filmmakers. And Apple, they've got this platform. They got all these devices out there, all this hardware with this free app on it. They need content. And they've got the money where they can take as many creative risks as they like. If they lose each and every single dollar that they invested in this movie, who cares? The relative to their overall balance sheet, the budget of this film is so insignificant and so infinitesimally small, I bet Tim Cook doesn't even know that they made this fucking thing. I mean, I'm only being half serious, but like I said, they can lose every single dollar that they invest in this because it's just icing on the cake. It's just some additional content to enjoy on your devices. They just happened to go the extra mile and deliver a really solid movie. So who's responsible for this cool psychological thriller as it's being described? I don't think it's really a psychological thriller. It's not a heist movie. It's just, it's a con movie. And... It's directed by Benjamin Caron, or Karen. He, the only work of his that I was familiar with prior to seeing this movie, he directed a couple of episodes of Andor. He directed episodes 7, 11, and 12. But you're not going to really detect the influence of Andor on this particular concept. They're very different in style and tone and genre. It's more of like a throwback to the 90s. We had a lot of really cool crime films set in New York, where they were just smart entertainment. And like those movies back then, Sharper, no pun intended, delivers razor-sharp dialogue. It has an incredible ensemble cast. And it's photographed by people who understand the decadent pleasure of seeing real pictorial beauty projected on the big screen. So shout out to DP Charlotte Bruce Christensen, who shot this. And I don't know if it's due to her or the director, but it almost feels like the cast and crew of this movie for weeks must have been on a steady diet of films by people like Abel Ferrara or Sidney Lumet or Michael Mann. And admittedly, Michael Mann did not shoot movies set in New York, but the crime films that he made, movies like Thief or Manhunter, you can definitely feel that influence where photographically it's just... So it's just so gorgeous to look at, and the, the neon lights are incredible, but it's also the music. The music give, gives the film this incredible pulse. So shout out to composer Clint Menzel, who did the music for this film. And he's got a long career of working on cool projects, movies like Black Swan, yet another cool New York movie. But I can't believe I've gotten this far without giving a shout out to the screenplay by Brian Gatewood and Alessandro Tanaka, because if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage, and... All these cinematic qualities that this film can lay claim to, they would mean nothing if you didn't have this incredibly dense, crackling, just kick-ass storytelling structure to provide the foundation for all these other ingredients. But I guess I should just go ahead and admit my bias because I'm a sucker for cool flicks about New York. I mean, going back to like 1950, you've had a lot of people using New York as a location. It's one of the most inherently cinematic cities on the planet. I moved here in 2008, completely fell in love with it. I don't think that I'll ever be leaving. But every once in a while, you'll see a movie that really seems to get why people fall so in love with the city and why it's so seductive and why it's so gritty and intense, but also how exciting it can be. I mean, admittedly, New York can be an adversarial city because you're walking on the streets, you're riding the subway, everybody's right up against each other and so you don't have the kind of protection of your car and that sort of thing kind of keeping you keeping like the rest of society at arm's length 
But this movie, in a lot of ways, is a true love song to just the vibe and the pulse of this city. And when you see people hanging out in bookshops on Thompson Street, talking about Italian film or classic works of American literature and that sort of thing, it just feels like New York. But enough about how much I love New York. Let's talk about the movie itself. The log line on Wikipedia is kind of pathetic, but here it is. It's described as, a young man exacts revenge on his family for not accepting him and cons other rich people to gain the wealth he desires. None of that is true. Or <laughs> It's like barely kind of tangentially true, which maybe that's just yet another con where they're trying to do a total misdirect with the official synopsis so that people go into this movie not knowing what to expect. But what's interesting about the flick, and this is not a spoiler because it's the very first shot, just a title card describing what a sharper is. And a sharper is basically a grifter, somebody who plays angles, somebody who survives on their wits. And from the moment you see that title card, you're like, okay, I get it. This is going to be a movie about people outsmarting and outwitting one another. But the genius of the movie is just how many times it'll catch you with these cons in spite of the fact that you know they're coming. Because I had my guard up. I was skeptical and suspicious and looking at every character with a cynical eye. And yet, I still found myself periodically getting taken in by these various, I guess, um, like the ruses that they create, like these personas that they adopt in order to take people in, in order to take advantage of them. And the story almost unfolds in a novelistic fashion where you're introduced to a character, you'll see them do a job, and that'll lead into yet another story with a related character, which will lead into yet another story with yet another related character, and then slowly but surely, the circle is complete, and you see how all these characters are interconnected and I was just kind of pinching myself throughout it. Like, is this as good as I think it is? Like, is the dialogue this good? Are the performances this good? Is it that inherently cinematic? And yes, it is. And a large part of the credit, or I guess a huge chunk of the credit, goes to the incredible cast that they assemble for this because the cast is all killer, no filler. And I'm just going to go through them all one at a time. So Brianna Middleton, who I'd never seen in a movie before, she plays Sandra. You're going to be seeing a lot more of her. She in many scenes steals the show and she's stealing the show from actors who know how to steal scenes because she's working alongside people like Sebastian Stan and Sebastian Stan. I'm th thrilled that he has all that money from Marvel to rely upon and the, uh, the occasional gig coming his way from the MCU. But these are the kinds of movies that he should be doing a lot more of. And, I, and that's obviously easier said than done. Most actors are looking for great material. They want to do cool movies. It's hard to find good material. I, I worked as a script reader for Phoenix Pictures for years, and we would get dozens, sometimes hundreds of screenplays coming through that, uh, through that production office every week, and almost all of them were terrible. And so, yeah, finding great material is a big challenge for great, uh, for great actors. But let's just give a shout out to the great Julianne Moore, who also produced this movie, and at this point, her, her filmography is so good and so strong and has so many classics. She's an actress who clearly has an eye for great material. And I will admit that I've been nursing and maintaining a celebrity crush for Julianne Moore since the early 90s. I mean, she was one of the queens of the 1990s when she was working on movies directed by guys like Robert Altman or the Coen Brothers or Paul Thomas Anderson. But she was also doing mainstream gigs and so on and so forth. But goddamn, the 90s, it was a good time to be a Julianne, Julianne Moore fan. Her movies like Safe, I mean, she's incredible. But here she is in her 60s. And she's still a stone-cold fox. And I know some people say, how dare you objectify her and degrade her by complimenting her appearance. But she's sexy as fuck in this movie. When you're watching, you're like, oh my God, like this girl's like old enough to be like the grandmother of a lot of the characters. And she's still commanding everyone's attention. She's so confident and so cool. And the role she plays is incredible. I feel like she's the textbook example of an actor taking the reins of their own career, producing the kind of movies that they want to appear in. So yeah, I feel like actors who just go to casting calls all the time and are constantly dealing with that kind of rejection, it just, it's bruising and punishing. So I feel like every, every time an actor chooses to be more entrepreneurial and get behind a project and help organize it and raise the money, they're taking control ultimately of their destiny and their fate. But I haven't mentioned Justice Smith yet, who's damn good in this. The only thing I'd seen him in prior to this was The Voyeurs, but 
frankly. When I was watching the Voyeurs, I wasn't really paying attention to Justice Smith. I was paying attention to Sidney Sweeney and the various highlight, basically highlight reel nudity scenes from that flick. If you've not seen the Voyeurs, hunt it down. It's well worth a look, but Justice Smith, he's about to pop. He's in the upcoming Dungeons and Dragons movie. And much like with actress Brianna Middleton, we're going to be seeing a lot more Justice Smith in the years to come. But the real show-stopping performance in this comes from somebody who's been giving us great performances for decades. I've been watching him my entire life. The great John Lithgow, who really knows how to deliver this kind of dialogue where it's just mean and aggressive, where you can tell like the writers, they probably love watching uh, plays and movies written by people like David Mamet, where it's just like, like you feel like, like the dialogue's going to cut you. John Lithgow, he knows this world. He knows this genre. I mean, he worked repeatedly with directors like Brian De Palma. He gets it, but he's just such an absolute legend. And so it's always just great to see somebody who's an old timer, who's still finding great work, great roles, and showing that he has not lost a step when it comes to his gifts as a performer. And so long story short, and I hate to sound like an old geezer as I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is what people are talking about when they ask the question, how come they don't make movies like they used to? If you're a movie lover, it doesn't matter what era you're a movie lover from, as you get older, at a certain point, maybe you've kind of fallen out of step with the culture at large or whatever the case might be, but if, if you were a movie fan of the 30s and 40s, I imagine in the late 60s you felt like, how come they don't make movies like they used to? Or if you're a movie fan from the early 70s, by the time you get to the, like the late 80s, you're like, oh my God, like how come they don't make movies like they used to? But if you're a movie fan in the 90s, and you're in your 40s now, you might often ask, like, how come they don't make movies like they used to? Like, How can we only get great shows, but we so rarely get great movies? Well, this is one of those movies that people are talking about. It is good. I'm not going to oversell it. I'm not going to say it's going to be the next Glengarry Glen Ross or something like that where people are going to be quoting it for years. I don't think it's a very quotable movie, but it's a very gripping and thrilling and entertaining movie, and I would have to watch it again to know like how much like staying power I think it's going to have. But it is sharp. It is entertaining. It is slick. It is polished. It's sexy. It's fucking good. And if you want to see more good movies, well, then you need to watch them. You need to talk about them. You need to recommend them. And if enough people watch it and keep talking about it, well, guess what? People will feel emboldened to make more movies like this. So let's all reward producer Julianne Moore and writer Brian Gatewood and writer Alessandro Tanaka and director Benjamin Caron. Caron? Karen? Somebody out there will have to tell me how to pronounce this name, but let's all reward them for their efforts for getting behind this flick and making it happen. And that way, A24 and Apple will give us more. Now, I've been going quite a spell at this point without articulating any criticisms of the film, and I have a big one, but you might describe it as being very spoiler light or kind of spoiler adjacent. And if you're incredibly sensitive to any sort of spoilers of any kind, bail out now. But I can't make my final point without kind of getting into the weeds a little bit with the details of the overall plot. But my criticism is that the movie does its job a little too well. And what I mean by that is that over the course of the film, we become so conditioned to be cynical and jaded and skeptical about anything anybody's saying that we start to kind of get very observant for people that are playing certain angles and what double crosses they might be about to uh, put into action. And so the final few twists in the movie... You're not going to know what those twists are, but you're going to feel them coming. Like, all right, at this point, I get it. Everybody's double-crossing everybody. What is the next double-cross going to be? And then what makes it less satisfying than some of the earlier double-crosses, the ending starts to feel a little rushed, almost like they're trying to shave off a few minutes for uh, the running time of the film because as the film progresses, it does start to feel a little long because every time you go from one character to another, you have to kind of do like a big reset and like, all right, now we got to kind of start over. And I get why they felt like they needed to condense it. But the early scenes, they like time slows to a crawl and you really get invested and you really get on firm footing before they pull out the rug from underneath you. And so toward the end, when it starts to really kind of gallop through the final few scenes, you never get a chance to get settled. And so the double crosses have less weight and less impact. And so if you're expecting some major withering comment about the movie, I imagine you're like, wait a second, that's all you're going to say is that the movie does its job too well. But it is a flaw because as you're watching it, if you're a movie lover, you're going to be saying to yourself like, ooh, please stay good, please stay good. Because we've seen so many movies in the past where they start strong or they get going 
and then they disappoint. And this movie doesn't disappoint, but it just it goes from like a nine or nine point five out of ten down to like a like an eight point three at the end. So you're like, oh, okay, it's still fantastic, it's still entertaining, but you don't walk out of the theater doing cartwheels like, oh my god, that's the coolest fucking thing ever. And I realized I just spat as I was speaking. I see a bubble right here on my desk. That's attractive for a YouTube video which is maybe a sign that I should wrap up this video. So I will be watching whatever movies Benjamin Caron makes in the future. I'm not seeing any upcoming projects here on IMDb, but he obviously learned his lessons well in the world of TV. I mean, he did episodes of Sherlock. He worked on The Crown. He worked on Andor. But I love how he is switching into film. And I feel like we're living in an era right now where... Like the money and the eyeballs, it's all in streaming. It's all in these shows. But this is clearly a guy who's like, you know what? I'm going to sharpen my teeth on these shows, and then I'm going to make a fucking movie. So as a movie lover, I appreciate his uh, his career switch and change in direction. And I hope he'll make more movies for A24 and Apple in the future. But before I wrap things up, I do have to bring you some breaking news from the sponsor of my podcast, Manscaped. Because now Manscaped is selling beer products. That's right. They are once again revolutionizing men's grooming with the brand new Beard Hedger Pro Kit. From a beard trim to a fresh shave, the technology behind the Beard Hedger Pro Kit allows you to shape your signature beard look. I don't really have a beard, but it's because I go totally bald. Well, anyway, less said about that, the better. I don't want to conjure too many images in your brain. But now you can finally use Manscaped products to make your drapes match your carpet by going <laughs> to Manscaped.com. Um, and using the discount code WRONGREAL in all caps for 20% off and free shipping. So join the 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped and check out the performance package 4.0. And remember that a grooming routine is not complete without applying Crop Preserver and Crop Reviver before showing off your freshly groomed self. These unique formulations take care of the smelliest part of your body and are a big boost to your confidence when you're stripping down for somebody else's prying eyes. And to complete the set, Manscaped includes their Shed Travel Bag and anti-chafing boxer briefs as free gifts to keep all your goodies stored comfortably. So if you like my channel, please consider supporting it by going over to manscaped.com and making a purchase with the discount code WRONGREAL in all caps. But even better, consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and hitting that notification bell. And you can always talk to me about flicks or show over on Twitter at Geekin' Out. But thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.